Today we're going over low back pain with leg pain, right? And so if we think about leg pain, it can be split into two different categories, right? Um, the related or uh, the related leg pain or the radiating leg pain. Related sometimes gets another name, referred pain. So if I said, oh, I got low back pain with referred pain, low back pain with related leg pain, those are kind of the same. And then you have this other category, radiating leg pain. If I, for, if I threw the first question out there, what is the big difference between those two? All right, you guys can throw that in chat. Um, what do you think? What's the, the biggest difference between having related leg pain and radiating leg pain? Cassie says the source of the pain, we have okay. nerve involvement, peripheral nerve irritation. Perfect. Ben, yeah. Radiating is coming from a nerve and follows a pattern. Referral is more broad and comes from another tissue. Perfect. So if we had to say, if we had to say one big difference between it is there's a nerve involvement, right? They both go down the leg, but one of them, the pain that's going down the leg, right, is coming from a nerve tissue. The other one is more of referred somatic referral doesn't have anything to do with the nerve, potentially. So that's the biggest thing. Um, if we look at the guidelines for low back pain, oops, if we look at the low back pain guidelines, right? they have it split into six, kind of seven different um, ICF categories, right? And so the two we'll be talking about is your related back pain, which if we think of differential diagnosis, right? Um, you kind of have this flat back syndrome, doesn't really help us too much. And then you have like discs. So if it's coming from a disc, you're more likely to get referred or related leg pain versus if it's more radiating pain, you think that's more related to a nerve root impingement, right? So the tricky part comes is, um, what are some of the things that can impinge a nerve? Right, if we're calling it radiating pain, so the nerve is being irritated at the spine, right? What are some of the common things that would irritate that nerve? A disc bulge? Yeah, a disc bulge, right? So we just got done saying that disc is referred pain, right? But a disc bulge or a disc herniation, if it's large enough to decrease the intervertebral space where the nerve root goes through, if the disc bulge is big enough or herniates big enough, it can actually be radiating pain because it's irritating the nerve, right? So it's kind of this tricky thing where um, it could cause it. What else can irritate the nerve? We have compression, lack of space in the foramina, foraminal stenosis. Awesome, good job guys, yeah, all those. Um, yep, so it decreased space where the nerve root comes out in the intervertebral foramen, and it could be decreased for a number of reasons, right? It could be a structural decrease where you have osteophytes and arthritic changes. Um, if you have degenerative disc disease where your spine gets a little closer together maybe, you're more likely to have a less space. If you have some type of movement fault where you're kind of hanging out more to one side and side bend and extension, that can decrease it, right? So it's a postural thing, right? Any, uh, any other reasons why someone might have pain going down their leg? Like related to maybe the spine? Tendinopathy, sciatic nerve. Okay, yeah, so tendinopathy um, can cause pain locally in the leg, doesn't tend to refer too far down. But uh, yeah, if we have, let's say we have sciatic nerve stuff or peripheral nerve, right? That's not necessarily covered under today's because we're going to call it low back pain with radiating related. So we're saying it's more the source is going to be the spine, um, less so than like maybe piriformis or other types of nerve entrapments a little distally. All right. But the one I want you guys to kind of look on is that very last category. All right. So chronic low back pain with generalized pain. Right now the category is kind of called more persistent pain syndrome. Right. So someone may have just chronic pain, and what happens during chronic pain is we know that our nervous system in general becomes hypersensitive, right? So it may just be that this, you have the local back pain that you've had for 20 years, and you all of a sudden you just start to get some smudging going on, some hypersensitivity, and now you start to have pain down your legs, um, which really isn't related to any type of like uh, actual true lumbar radiculopathy or a true disc bulge. It's really related to more of a, a centralized component and your nervous system is just hypersensitivity or hypersensitive. So if, that would be kind of the third one I want you guys to keep in the back of your mind that okay all right so again if we have symptoms going down the leg right 
you guys already nailed it. I think someone threw out earlier, it's gonna follow a very localized pattern, right? A very specific nerve root pattern, right? Or it may be more broad and general and just like fuzzy down the leg, right? The bottom picture there, where it's like the whole leg's covered, it doesn't have to do that. It may be that it kind of skips the front of the thigh and it's more just the front of the calf, but it's not like this nice fine line. It's like, oh, it's just here, right? It's the people that can't pinpoint it, right? Well, one of the questions I ask in the clinic is like, you know, if you, can you kind of point to your pain with one finger? And if they can't, it's like, well, it's like, it's here and it's all over. You kind of start to think, all right, maybe it's more of this general diffuse. Okay, good. So differentials, we kind of already talked about, right? Dick, discogenic, radiculopathy, good job, right? Key findings, right? So now it's time to get into our objective exam, all right? What are some of the key findings? What are you guys going to do to this person objectively to kind of help strengthen your hypothesis or rule out your hypothesis? Slump test, straight leg raise. Okay. Maximum dermatomes, deep tendon reflexes. Perfect. Okay. So what I heard was I heard some nerve tension tests, slump and straight leg raise. I heard some nerve, uh, nerve tests, um, dermatomes, myotomes, reflexes. Good. What else? We have directional preferences. Okay, so active range of motion tends to pick those up. Positions of comfort kind of can help us as well. Thomas test, a cross straight leg raise. Okay, all right, so what is cross straight leg raise used for? Herniation? Yeah, yeah, so. If you have a positive cross straight leg raise, it kind of leads to, or it's specific for um, a lumbar herniation. Good. All right. So I think you guys nailed it. Lumbar assessment. So that's going to be our active range of motion. Are we able to pick up any type of um, directional preference? Right. All right. Centralization. Right. Um, what are we looking for when we talk about centralization? In case that word is not familiar to people. Nina says, see if flexion produces pain. Yeah, okay, good. So then what would the opposite be called? Does the pain start to leave the leg and go more, more in, in the back? Perfect. Okay, all right, and so that would be more, um, so central versus peripheral. So centralization means it's becoming more central to the spine. Peripheralization means it's kind of going more distal down the leg, all right? And so when we talk about this, assessment, right? We're doing repeated movements. So if anybody's familiar with like McKinsey, right? Um, that's kind of what he does a lot of it, these repeated movements, looking to see does the location of the pain change, right? And so what type of leg pain would we have if the location of the pain changes as we do repeated movements? So I'm doing repeated flexion, bending forward, right? Um, what type of leg pain would that fit in? Would that fit under radiating pain or related leg pain? Related. Yeah, exactly. Related. So, and what makes it positive, and this is kind of an important concept, what makes it positive is not that it hurts, but that the location changes. So if I bend over once and the person says, yeah, I feel that in my leg, I'm going to be kind of a little more specific, like where exactly? You know, it goes down to my knee. Okay, let's repeat that six more times, 10 more times. All right, he bends forward. Every time he bends forward, it hurts. And I'm like, all right, so what happened? What happened to your pain? You know, my pain got a little worse. Did it go anywhere different? No, it just stayed right behind my knee every time, All right? So even though the pain got worse, did the location centralize or peripheralize? No, it stayed the same. So really that'd be a negative test, All right? So the key concept is that it actually changes location, not necessarily that the intensity gets worse, All right? Because I could have someone with nerve pain, when they bend forward, that's like a big tug, All right? That's like a standing slump test almost, All right? Where it may get pain down their leg, but if I did it every single time, the pain would kind of be the same. Right? It wouldn't necessarily travel, get change, the location wouldn't change. All right, good. Um, lower quarter neuro exam, you guys already nailed those three or four, and then your neurodynamic exam. Right? So that's pretty much our key findings for the pain going down the leg. All right, and we're just trying to identify, is this pain coming from a nerve and the nerves involved, or is this pain coming from a structure in the back that's just causing pain to be felt in the legs for referred pain? So 
perfect. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna switch over to the app, right? So I'm under PhysioU, and if I click on the first one, clinical pattern recognition, oops, right? Lumbar, right? Pain patterns, right? So under our pain patterns, right, we're gonna be kind of living in these two, right? So if I click on this one, where it's very narrow, specific, right? This would be our radiating, right? So you have generalized it. So we click sciatica, which isn't maybe the best term to use here versus lumbar radiculopathy, right? Um, clinical findings, right? You're gonna see all, a lot of these nerve stuff. So lower extremity paresthesias, uh, radicular symptoms, lower limb tension tests, nerve root involvement. So it kind of fits that pattern, right? If we look at physical exam, key findings, right? Our lumbar assessment, lower curtain neuro assessment, neurodynamics, right? So straight leg raise, right? So it kind of fits that, that pattern with there. All right, so let me go back. If I go to the other one, right? So let's say I go to this one, right? You're gonna see the same hypotheses, but it's more likely going to be the one on top, right? The discogenic related pain, right? So prevalence, prevalence is more of like the demographics, who's most likely to get it. So what do you guys think? Who's most likely to get um, low back pain with related leg pain? So a referral from the disc. Under 40? Uh, yeah, Ooh. younger. We have a lot. We have under 40, older population, middle-aged women. Okay. So majority of it is going to be lower, right? Because if we think about the anatomy of a disc, right, the annulus that runs around all those ligaments, you have this kind of juicy propulsion in the middle. It is. It has the most amount of fluid when we're younger. As we get older, right, a lot of that fluid kind of decreases. The disc doesn't become as mobile as it used to. So it becomes kind of this little bit, little dried up, quote unquote, for a lack of better term, becomes dried up. So when we injure our disc, when we get a disc bulge, um, really it's the annulus ligament being stretched, right? If you think of it like spraining your ankle, right? It's stretching that tissue, um, which then causes referred pain, right? Now, if it's bad enough where the tissue breaks and you might have some type of like leaking coming out, right? So now you have a herniation versus a bulge. The bulge is just kind of like where it's being stretched Right? Like it's like spraining your ankle grade one, you stretched the ligament, but it didn't necessarily rupture. Herniation is you stretched it far enough where it kind of ruptured. Um, so that's kind of the idea. So that happens a lot more in younger people because they have the mobility to sprain it. Right? As we get older, this becomes a little bit more dried up, more degenerative. One, we don't necessarily have as much mobility in our spine to stretch it. So we're more limited by the joints. And two, we don't have as much fluid in there to make things move around. So more likely the, the lower. The other thing is if they do have a disc irritation, a lot of times it's going to go past the knee, right? Um, so one of the, if you think back to when we did mobility a couple of months ago for low back pain mobility, we were talking about grade fives and manipulations, right? One of the, one of the distinct factors for getting a benefit from a grade five is that symptoms do not go past the knee, right? Because then you're kind of like ruling out discogenic pain and like, oh, it's probably more of a facet mobility deficit. All right, physical exam, right? So key finds gonna look very similar, right? You're gonna have your lumbar assessment, but you're gonna really have this centralized category. You didn't see this in our lumbar radiculopathy person, right? Here we're trying to say, if we do lateral shifts side to side, so side glides, if we manually correct them, or if they do a bunch of repeated movements, can we centralize or peripheralize their pain, right? And the key thing is what? Change in location, right? Change of location, All right? So. So it's kind of easy to get the diagnosis, right? That's kind of the easy part. Like, hey, you do a straight leg raise, it hurts. You do repeated move, movements and it centralizes or peripheralizes. Um, so it's like, okay, we know what the diagnosis is, but as, as therapists, right, as rehab specialists, we need to know what are we gonna treat, right? We can use the evidence to say, oh, we're gonna treat the disc with repeated movements. We can treat the nerve with nerve glides, right? There's kind of these one-to-one, -one, which is nice. But why did someone, why did someone get this nerve root irritation? Why did someone get this disc irritation? So that's kind of where we want to say, well, what are some of the common movement faults, right? So if I ask you guys, um, if someone has discogenic pain, 
right? What would be the common movement fault? What might they do too much, too often, or in a faulty pattern? Another terminology tends to be what's called directional preference. And what do they, how do they tend to move wrong in? Flexion. Flexion, yeah, yeah. And is it that they lack flexion or that they maybe flex too much? Prolonged flexion, they love flexion. Love yes. flexion. Until they hurt the disc, then they hate flexion, right? <laughs> then they avoid it at all costs. Um, but what's interesting is when you see them in the clinic, they actually come in in like this flat back posture. So they're actually stuck in a little bit of flexion, um, which is like, wow, you would think that flexion hurts. They can't move into any more flexion. And we, our goal is to try to push them into extension to make things feel better. That's kind of the, the, how that centralization works. Good. How about for someone with like a lumbar radiculopathy? Right. What movement fault or movement pattern might they have? Extension. Extension, yeah. Extension, perfect. And what would be some of the common, what would be some of the common aggravating factors that we'd expect them to tell us? So you're doing your patient interview, you're subjective. Um, what would we expect them to hurt? We'd expect them to, they're not going to tell us, oh, it hurts when I extend. Right. They think functionally. What would be some things they'd have problems with? We have sitting and standing. Okay. So I'd say the sitting is going to fit more into your related leg pain, your discogenic person, the flexion, versus the walking, the standing, the reaching up. Right? That's going to fit more into your lumbar radiculopathy, your extension. Right? So if I kind of come back to here. Right? So recap-wise, related leg pain, lateral shift, repeated movements, centralization versus peripheralization. A differential is pretty important. If I check all these nerve stuff, and I think this is related to a, a disc bulge, not a disc herniation, a disc bulge, there's no nerve involvement, these should all be negative, right? They should have normal reflexes, normal myotomes, normal dermatomes, because there is no nerve involvement. What they feel in their leg is referred from the spinal, from the low back disc, right? The lumbar disc, right? Can you guys see how I wrote false positives under this neurodynamics? Why do you guys think that is? Why do you think that someone who has no nerve problem, they have a disc problem, might actually test positive for nerve tension tests? They're scared. Okay. So, okay. So possibly there's some maybe hypersensitivity. So as you're doing a straight leg raise or a slump and they feel tension in their nerve, we all have nerve tension, right? I haven't seen one person that I couldn't bring on some nerve tension in their leg. It may be at 120 degrees of hip flexion, right? But everybody eventually has nerve tension. So yeah, you're right. That could be it. What else? The disc impacts the nerves. Okay. Um, how, how so, I guess? How does that? If I'm laying supine on my back, I'm doing a straight leg raise. What happens once I reach a point of tension in the nerve or the hamstring? What do you guys think? Decrease neuromobility or compensation? Okay, yeah. So compensation. If I'm taking someone's leg and I'm bringing it all the way up into a straight leg raise, once I start to reach tension, normally your pelvis might start to do a posterior tilt. Right? It's pretty normal. All right, so if my pelvis does a posterior tilt, what is that? What occurs at my lumbar spine? All right, flexion. Well, we already know that with discogenic patients, flexion is painful. So now you have this, hey, I'm doing a straight leg raise. I think I'm testing the nerve. But really, once I hit tension, I may be actually testing compensated lumbar flexion. All right? So hey, it hurts. All right, so it's kind of being aware of, hey, when I'm testing this, what is the spine doing? The spine shouldn't be moving, right? What's another very common nerve tension test besides straight leg raise? Slump test. Slump. What, what happens to the lumbar spine when we do a slump test? Flexion. Flexion, right? So I flex down, it hurts. I straighten my leg out, that pulls my pelvis. Now I'm in all this flexion. I'm saying, yeah, yeah, that hurts, that hurts. So we, we, we might be like, oh, positive for nerve tension. This must be a nerve root involvement. So we must do, we got to do sliders. We got to do tensioners. And really, 
there is no nerve root involvement. It was just, we let them go into maybe too much flexion. Maybe we didn't sensitize it enough, right? Um, yeah, good. So that's kind of the imp important concept because it actually changes treatment. Right. Good. Uh, I was supposed to click these as I said them. Timing's off. All right. So now if we move on from related to radiating, right, we could have flexion sensitive, which could be there's a disc herniation. So now no longer disc bulge where it's just stretching and the disc is relating pain. It's actually where the disc had a tear and now it's taking up space in, this, in the intervertebral foramen. Now the disc is taking up space, the nerve is irritated. So every time I bend forward, that kind of stretches the disc more, takes up more room, puts tension on the nerve and it hurts. So we can have a flexion sensitive um, radiating leg pain. We also have extension sensitive, which is from the foramen. So you guys nailed those out pretty nice. Um, kind of what's important to remember though, Acute, subacute, or chronic? Why is that? In, why is that important? Why do you think it's important to kind of identify what stage they're at? Intervention used. Webinar. Say that one more time. Sorry. Ability and the intervention used. Yeah. How, how so? Can you be a little more specific? Whoever, whoever wrote that, that's a great answer. Um, how would it change what intervention you would use? If it's more on the acute end of it, then some mobilizations might be um, more called for, yep. like some thrust strength mobilizations. Okay, mobilizations to the spine or more mobilizations to the nerve? Spine. Perfect, okay, yeah. So maybe we'd work on, so if we kind of fancy that term up, we'll work on entrapment site reduction, right? So we're gonna see if we can open spaces up before we just start tugging on the nerve. Versus if it's chronic, right? The nerve's been irritated for a long time. Maybe there's not an inflammatory component. It's just a mobility component of the nerve. Yeah, we want to crank on that puppy. Um, yeah, so it's kind of identifying, is this more inflammatory and the nerve is stuck in the spot? Open it up. Maybe the nerve is just sensitive because it hasn't moved in a while. Um, and it's, for lack of a better term, a stiff nerve, but more it's just a nerve that doesn't glide well. Let's work on mobilization to the nerve. So good answer. Okay, so if we think about movement faults, right, you guys kind of already said it. If it's a flexion fault, maybe we're thinking more discogenic, more related, but it can become radiating if the disc is bad enough, right? Hopefully that concept's coming across. Extension, we think more nerve root impingement, right? So um, this will be a harder tech question, we'll see. What are some of, do you guys, can you guys think of some of what are some movement tests for flexion? All right, some of you guys might not know exactly what we're talking about. Um, but there's certain tests that people do that, that we can do kind of a lot of it comes from Sarman or Yonda that look at how somebody moves and it kind of tells us what they what they favor, what's their common movement pattern. So if we're thinking flexion, what are some common flexion tests? The easy one is bending forwards. So we'll take that off the table, All right? Lumbar flexion. That's psh, yeah, yeah. Seated knee extension as our first one. What do you, what do we have? Sorry. Seated knee extension. Check. Good. So you kick the leg out. The pelvis posterior tilt shouldn't happen, right? Should be neutral. Good. What, what, what else? Quad rock back. Yeah, quad rock back, right? When you rock back, your, your spine should stay relatively neutral and you should move in your hips, right? Good. Nice. Two, what else? Forward flexion with abdominal support, abdominal stability. Okay, so, so forward flexion would be the test. And then maybe the correction would be hey, let's see if we can get more trunk stave going, so good. Squat? Yeah, squat's a great one, right? It's very functional. Um, and it doesn't have to be like this deep, big squat for like, uh, like you're at the gym. You can just be bending over to pick up a pencil or your wallet off a chair. But yeah, looking at how do they hip hinge? When Do they initiate the motion with hip flexion? Or do they just start right up on lumbar flexion? Great, how about for uh, extension? So let's see if you got them. So forward bend, seated, knee extension, all right, unilateral hip. So the one you guys didn't say was unilateral hip and knee flexion in supine. So again, supine, looking at how the hip flexes, right? The hip should flex up to a certain degree without the spine moving. And then eventually, if you go to the end end range, you'll post your tilt. But the idea is, do they flex their spine early? So what about extension? What, what, are, some, what are some common extension faults? Some tests you would do to see if someone goes into extension too soon, too much, too early, too often.
Kevin wants to know is descending stairs one. Um, you know, it, it's not one of the typical tests that are part of like the exam, but um, it could, uh, if that's when they get their pain, I would definitely look at it to see, do they go into extension? Um, they may, um, it's not common, but yeah, they, they definitely, especially that's their ag, they're telling you, man, I get my leg pain when I go down the stairs, I'm gonna look at it. Um, but it's not typical because you're in, when you go downstairs, you're normally going forward, um, but yeah. What else? We have bilateral shoulder flexion. Yep. Yep. So if I reach up with both arms, does that make my back extend or am I just moving from my glenohumeral joint and my thoracic spine, right? Normal should be glenohumeral and thoracic. If I don't have good coordination, maybe I'll extend my lumbar. Marching or squats. Okay. So squat can be another good one in the sense that, uh, when you go down, right, people are kind of taught to keep their spine in neutral. Um, but if they, if they don't, maybe they hyperextend their spine to try to lock it out, right? That's kind of sometimes with um, big weight lifters, they're trying to protect their back. So they've learned to kind of hyperextend it to lock it out. Um, but maybe they're doing it too much, too often, too soon, even when they're lifting little tiny weights, right? Same issue. All right, good. All right, so some of the other ones, maybe a little lower level would be when someone bends forward, we think of that as a flexion test. So they have to come back up, right? So return from forward bend is often a test for someone with extension problems. Um, back bend we talked about. Um, so lying on your back with your knees straight, right? So a lot of times people are going to talk about, man, I can't lay on my back. I can't lay on my stomach. Because if you have a little bit of an anterior pelvic tilt, that will pull you into extension. Right? You guys said bilateral shoulder flexion. Good job. And then... Some of the ones we didn't talk about were Thomas test, right? If you're putting someone at the edge of the table and you lower that leg down, eventually the weight of the leg, right? It pulls on that hip flexor and it could pull the lumbar into extension, right? Ideally, the leg should just hang. That'd be awesome if it just hung right at the table. But the majority of the time, it's gonna pull someone's spine into extension. And then, the, and then the second last one would be hip extension. So someone's laying on their stomach, they lift their leg up, where should the motion come from, right? It should come from the hip joint, right? They may get a little bit of lumbar extension, but really it should be glute max is working, hamstrings working, legs extending. Shouldn't be lots of lumbar extension or extension rotation, right? Good. All right, and then send the last one would be rotation, right? So rotation kind of fit into flexion or extension, right? Majority of the time people have unilateral leg symptoms more often than bilateral unless it's the central stenosis, right? Majority of the time, someone's gonna have a lumbar radic. It's not gonna be both legs. Um, so we wanna say, well, if it's only unilateral, there may be some type of rotation problem to that side with the flexion or with the extension, right? So we have some tests we'd wanna look at, like side bend, bent knee fallout, um, like laying on your side doing a clamshell, prone hip rotation is a big one. There's a lot of research about, can someone lie on their stomach with their hip at zero degrees, so in, in extension? And can they rotate their hip back and forth without their pelvis rotating, right? Shirley calls that the tail that wags the dog, right? Can you move your leg without your whole thing, right? It's crazy. We got a new dog in March, the week before quarantine started. So it actually ended up being great. But this dog has no core control. And she gets excited. She wags her tail. And it's pretty much her, her, her butt like hits herself in the shoulder because she has so much. She's like a slinky. Um, so it's very excited, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of movement going on there. All right. So if I go back to the app, we'll kind of show us where we're at. So, all right. If we go to movement faults, right. We can have flexion rotation, right. Movement fault analysis, right. So if you think about it right now, we are in our lumbar disc disorder because you only see flexion stuff, right. And so what we tried to do in the app is we tried to split it up into just the name of the tests. So maybe bending and sitting tests, right. But then also we tried to say, well, how about if we categorize them um, into rotation ones? Sorry, so we had flexion and we have rotation. But the other way we tried to organize is maybe it's not by movement test, but let's do it by functional movement, right? So if someone has flexion, right, they're going to tell you it hurts when I put my shoes on, getting out of a chair, driving, squatting. So if someone says they hurt with squatting, what are some movement tests I'd want to look at, right? Well, I'm going to look at quadruped rock back, right? Because that's where your hip needs to bend 
your spine should say relatively neutral. So it's trying to match what movement fault, right? So if someone's talking about when I get in and out of chairs, it's painful, right? Well, I'm gonna look at forward bend. How do they flex their hip in supine? How do they get out of a chair? Right? And the nice thing is these videos will show someone doing it faulty and then it shows over having to correct them into doing more of a hip hinge and say, hey, does that change your pain? Right? So that's kind of how a movement fault works is we watch them do it. If it hurts, did they do something that wasn't typical, wasn't normal, and then that maybe added stresses to the tissue? Can we change it? Can we change it and redo it? Right. If we switch from here, oops, let me go back to this one. If we switch to more of a radiating pain and we look at our movement faults, now they're going to be more, you might see more uh, extension based. Oops. Which one are we at? Let me just go back. There we go. Maybe this one, physical exam, movement faults. All right, so now you're gonna see more extension tests. All right, so we already talked about some of these things, return from forward bend, backwards bend, um, bilateral shoulder flexion, Thomas test, right? So you have all these examinations. But then also we can look at it as more of a functional thing. Right. Good. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's a physical exam. Okay. So besides movement faults, we've kind of walked through key findings, movement faults, associated impairments. So if you think about anytime we're dealing with the low back, right, we kind of want to look at what's above, what's below, right? So thoracic spines above, hips are below. I'm sure you guys can all think of a time where you had someone with low back pain and maybe you're working on thoracic extension mobility. I'm sure you guys can also think of a person who had low back pain and you're working on hip flexor stretching, maybe glute strengthening, right? So it's kind of interregional dependence where you can work above and below, right? That's kind of what that's saying is, hey, you know what? There's something driving their low back. Their low back is maybe this victim in the middle and we need to make them less stiff above and below so it's not so stressful on the middle. All right, let's go back to this. So that's kind of what this would be, your hip assessment, looking at thoracic mobility, trunk strength. What are some, what are some ways that you guys check trunk strength? All right. It's probably, you think about core strength is probably one of the most often given exercises for people with low back pain, right? Everybody thinks that if you can make someone's trunk stronger, Right. Patients even come in thinking, I just got to work on my core because you see it on all the YouTube videos and all that stuff. So we want to test it, right? I don't want to have someone work on their core muscles if they really don't need it. I don't want them to waste their time. So how do we assess? Planks, Sorensen's, and Sarman levels. Good. So planks, we have forward planks for more anterior muscles, side planks for lateral, right? We think about we should have norms, right? So forward plank, you're looking for a minute 10, minute 20. Side planks, you're looking for about 45 seconds. Sorensen's, you're looking for about a minute 50 for guys, over two minutes for girls, All right? So these are more like muscular endurance tests, right? Um, so those will be ones I'm, I'm sure Steven, with all the, with all those um, firefighters and police officers, like those are guys that need to be able to hold these things for a long time for endurance. Um, those are great tests, right? You think of also McGill has his ways to test them, right? McGill has his own separate way. Sarman has her way. In PT school, when I first learned it, it was a lot of like Kendall's way, like doing those sit-up tests. And can you get your scapulas off of the mat an inch? So there's lots of ways to assess someone's trunk control, right? So be open to that. Um, I would just say it's important to actually assess it so you know, is it impaired or not, right? Good, okay. So interventions. If I have radiating leg pain, someone already nailed it, right? We're gonna work on entrapment site and then nerve mobilizations, right? That's very direct. So what we wanna remember though is there's something that might have caused that nerve entrapment site. So the, the idea would be, can we move from, hey, we're working very directly on the nerve, directly on the entrapment site to eventually working on movement coordination, muscle strengthening to say, hey, let's get you to move better so you don't keep irritating the nerve, right? I, I often give the analogy to patients that, um, 
but we're all drippy faucets, right? We're all a faucet that doesn't turn off all the way and we're just dripping, drip, drip, drip. And we have a cup of water that's filling up. And eventually that cup fills up, right? And we really don't have any pain. We have no limitation. We're totally fine. But if the cup overflows, we start to get pain. So we can then empty the cup out, right? We can do all these mobilizations, nerve sliders, and that's us scooping out water from our cup. But really, it'd be nice to do things that turn the faucet off, right? So let, let's normalize how you move. Let's, let's get you a little stronger in your trunk muscles or glute muscles. Or, right? So there's kind of these two different ways to go after it. For related leg pain, what do you guys think? How would you treat related leg pain? Not all at once now. Repeated movements. Good. All right. So yeah, we're trying to cause centralization. All right. Perfect. Repeated movements, right? How would you start that? What would be maybe the first position you guys would try for repeated movements? Standing. Standing, okay. What direction would we be moving? Extension. We also have prone. Good. Okay. I would, I cannot disagree with either one of those, right? Now there's a little bit of an algorithm that McKinsey has. And if somebody has a lateral shift, right, often with um, acute disc bulges and disc you're going to have a lateral shift, right? Patients are shifting off of the side that hurts, right? A lot of times the disc becomes very inflamed. It's very painful to weight bear. So we shift off of it. So do we really want someone doing repeated extensions? If their trunk is an inch off of sideways from their pelvis, probably not. So we may need to work on repeated movements into um, shift corrections. So whether that's standing, doing like side glides, or more common is using the wall, right? People put their hand on the wall, and they do repeated movements into the wall, All right? We'll look at that later. Um, but let's say they don't have a shift correction. It looks good. They look nice. Uh, I'm probably going to try in standing, right? It's more functional. If I told someone I'd like you to do this three, four times a day, they're probably more likely to do it if they could just do it standing up at work versus having to lay on their stomach. All right, so, so what would determine why I would make someone probably recommend laying down versus standing up? Irritability or less load. Okay, yeah. So I, again, great answers. So if someone, when they do it in standing and it hurts too much, right? I'm going to say, hey, let's get it. Let's offload it. Let's get it to prone, maybe prone over a pillow, less load on it, less gravity. Um, now I know you're probably not going to do it nearly as much because it's a, it's a little bit more of an inconvenience. So when you do do it, I'm going to have you do more reps, right? So I'm going to have you do, I want you to do two sets of 30, two sets of 40, right? Maybe twice a day versus the guy that's able to get away with it in standing. I'd be like, hey, every hour I want you doing 15 of these, right? Um, so you might different your program because if you told them to do it every hour laying down, not going to happen, right? We all have things going on. So yeah, so a lot of it is, yep. Go ahead, somebody say something? Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, I actually had a question, but it yep. was uh, re relating back at the uh, radiating like pain. Mm -hmm. um, you may have said this already, but I was just wondering um, an example of just like entrapment site reduction. Yeah. So, yeah. So joint mobe is one easy example. Like if you put someone prone, prone over a pillow, and you're just working on mobilizations and you're trying to move that joint, right? Technically that can be an entrapment site reduction. Another common one is putting someone on their side, right? Maybe over a pillow and then working on like physiologic mobilizations. So maybe some side bending, maybe some, so if I go here, all right, um, let me go back one. So any type of movement that's kind of opening whatever joint is entrapping the nerve. Exactly, exactly. Okay, versus with related or referred pain, um, it seems like you're more focused on centralization. Exactly. So you could still do PAs to someone with related leg pain, 
because as you're doing mobilization to the spine, you're still kind of pushing them into movement that's not flexion, right? Maybe you're not doing it for you're not doing it for nerve um, nerve reduction anymore, entrapment type reduction, different different reason. You're not there's no nerve that's trapped, but you're still trying to get good motion at the lumbar spine, right? Um, yeah, hopefully that answers it. But yeah, it's like accessory mobility is just doing mobilizations is considered a nerve um, reduction. Let's try to look for some other ones. So I'll try to vent thoracic reduction. And I mean, you can also, I'm guessing there are probably also um, nerve reduction, you know, exercises or whatever you want to call them that you can kind of show the patient for like maybe like self mobilization as well. Totally, totally. So you think of like the sideline, like self neutral gap stuff where they're trying to open it up. I would just okay. say nor normally, let's say my right side is the one that's painful, right? Then I'm going to, I'm going to lay over, um, over pillows to create more of like a side bend motion, right? Be a like, I don't know, like a ballerina stretch or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That arm goes up, leg goes down. Yeah, so you're trying to just open up that foramen if we're going to nerve, nerve impingement reduction. Awesome. Thank you. That yep. definitely yep. answers yep. that. Thank you. Yep. And Dr. Lemoyne, we also had another question come in. Um, would you try to fix trunk control posture to decrease lower back pain? And I'll, I'll kind of reward that. Would that be one of the first things that you would be going for? Would it be that trunk control, kind of that postural, or are you really going for, like you just mentioned, centralization um, and tra entrapment reduction, um, mm -hmm. you know, first treatment? I would, I would say it purely depends on the patient, on the idea of what it is that bothers them. So if someone comes in and they're telling me it hurts, or hurts when they're getting dressed when they have to bend over to put their pants on or something and i say hey show me what you mean and they go and they do it and it, it just looks very very bad like they just have really bad technique they have poor control um and that's a, and i'm able to change it like hey i give them better control i teach them like i just do a quick assessment and give them better and, it, and their pain gets significantly better then do i really need to spend time working on an entrapment site reduction no because it's probably not that stuck because it's just they're able to change it, it gets better now let's say I can't change it, I can't change their movement, then I'm probably not going to work on trunk control today. I'm going to work on probably more symptom. Like, all right, what is what can I change in their symptoms? Right? That'd be one example. The second one would be the irritability. If someone comes in and they have resting pain, it just hurts no matter what. And yeah, it gets worse when they do things, but even at rest they have pain. My my biggest thing is to build this therapeutic alliance with the patient early on. The best way to do that is to help them out of pain. Right. So if someone has pain at rest, me trying to fix their posture and stuff, if it makes it go away hundred percent or makes it significantly decrease by changing how they sit, go for it. But really I'm probably going to work on opening the space up, getting nutrients to the nerve, making sure that the nerve has space, blood flow, movement, getting all those three things in there. And I can do that easier with MOBs and entrapment site reduction. Um, so it kind of depends on the patient. And uh, another question, kind of going back to our, for the uh, related referred uh, pain, when you are doing your uh, physical exam, your objective mm -hmm. and finding kind of objective measurements, are you, um, you're going through the lumbar spine, you're PAing, mm -hmm. let's say you find some mobility, um, some stiff segments, but are you also looking when you're PAing to, if, to kind of make it so that you're, you're this could be a, you know, a disc bulge, are you, are they going to have reproduction of symptoms most likely when you say you PA at L5? Yeah. Yeah. They're going to fit, but it, the goal is that it's local because you're not stretching disc tissue. When I PA somebody, right, that doesn't cause their spine to flex and cause things. So ideally it's going to be localized pain, maybe a little referred locally, but mm -hmm. we don't want, we don't want peripheralization down the leg. So if I'm PA somebody for in the low back for someone with related leg pain, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to cause peripheralization just like we wouldn't give them an exercise that causes peripheralization. But do we ever give them exercises that make their back hurt? Yeah. And we, and what do we normally say? Hey, it's okay. As long as it's getting closer to the spine, like as long as it's centralizing. Um, the, the caveat is if we can put them in a different position to have the back hurt less like standing versus like su prone versus supine. I'm all for that. Good questions. Good questions guys.
Also, um, just another question as far as for the um, entrapment site reduction. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know if it would be better for chronic or acute pain, or it doesn't really make a difference. It's more, it's more for acute pain, right? Um, chronic pain is more going to be nerve just doesn't slide well. All right. Um, so I'd say, but again, it could be both. Like if you find someone who you, they've had it for on and off for a couple of years, not that irritable and you push on their spine, it's going to hurt locally. I mean, I mean, but like, but like, Hey, that brings on my leg pain, right? By pushing on it, it brings on my leg pain. I may work on it, but ideally it's more like you push on it, hurts my back, hurts my back, doesn't go down the leg. I do a straight leg raise. Yeah. That goes down my leg. I feel that they're coming to see you because they have a lot of leg pain. I'm probably going to probably work more on nerve stuff, um, if that makes if that makes sense. Yeah, and also, I mean, um, I got you. But also, it it, re it does depend on how the patient presents. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So it's we're trying to like maybe generalize a little bit, but yeah, you can have people that are that are chronic. They bend backwards. It hurts. They don't have much mobility. It goes down their leg. You PA them. It goes down their leg. I mean, they're pretty much telling you, hey, there's my spine is pushing on my nerve. Let's, okay, so I may work on opening it up. Okay. You know, I may do something real quick if I find, just for, uh, this might be a good one. Ah, I'll do it later. It's hard because it puts the, uh, the zoom box above where all my controls are. There you go, okay. Um, Remind me at the end when we talk about entrapment site reductions, I'll pull some stuff up. Okay, so we talked about related, talked about radiating, um, associated impairments. And this may be where we step away from direct treatment to the nerve and the spine. And now we're working more on muscles control, motor control, looking at all those movement tests. And then obviously education. So we want to educate them on the, the direction of movements, the ways that they move that hurt them. Uh, we also want to work, teach them to be functionally. Hey, the more active you are, the more your nerves are moving, right? If any of you guys have had the chance to listen to David Butler, um, a nerve researcher out of Australia, like he's big on just having people like just dance across and move. There's always just when they're walking, just get these global movements because our nerves like to move um, versus what we tend to do now is we're just stuck in one place, right? We sit in one place and drive. We sit in one place, work on the computer. We then lay on our sides in that same position and sleep. So our nerves don't get as much stimulation and then you become sensitive, right? Um, I'll tell, I give the example to patients that if I, if I made a fist, right, nothing's wrong with my hand, nothing's broken, everything's perfect, but I made a fist and just closed it and decided, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on a protest and I'm gonna keep my fist closed for the next three weeks, month, two months. Never gonna open my fist for two months, right? And I, I ask them, like, how do you think it's gonna feel when I try to open it up, when I try to move it? right? Nothing's wrong with it. Nothing's broken, right? Things just get sensitive. Things don't move well, right? We all know how sensitive our nerve can be. And I'll tell them, remember your funny bone you hit and it shoots down, right? That's, that's a nerve, right? They become sensitive when they don't move a lot. So that's kind of hopefully trying to get maybe some buy-in to be active, try to get out of your chair money more, just try to walk more, right? Nerves respond well to, um, to movement. Can you guys think of an, an example where maybe you wouldn't want to stress the nerve and move the nerve a lot? Post-op? Okay, like post-op, like, like a nerve resection kind of post-op? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I had a lady, maybe like in January, February, who was a, a total hip replacement and they nicked her femoral nerve. Um, so one, her quad was crap. Unfortunately, um, she had great knee extension because you locked your knee out every single time she walked. Um, but uh, yeah, that's not someone we're going to give nerve sliders to, right? It's we're going to let that nerve regenerate, give it time, and eventually teach it to move. But right now, it's just healing, right? Good. So what else? What would be another um, an example of maybe not necessarily a surgery? A specific nerve injury? Yeah, like like what? what would, I mean, I guess there's. I'm I'm probably not asking this well, but there's you a said way. Neurotomesis. Okay, so yeah, that's I mean, that's a that's the different depth of which way the nerve is injured, how deep. I think more of a most of the time we're working on entrapment site reduction, 
because it's, it's compressed, it's trapped, it's not sliding, it's not moving well. But you have traction injuries as well, right? Where someone like to think about football players, um, different types of car accidents where the nerve gets tractioned, right? And it gets this big stretch on it. You get micro tears, you have nerve pain, neurogenic pain, numbness, tingling, burning. Those are things where we probably don't want to do tons of mobilizations early on. It's more going to unload it, keep the nerve closer together, let things heal, and then maybe you start moving it distally away from the site, right? So, but again, way more common in the clinic is going to be compression, right? Irritation, compression. Yeah. Good. And then again, general cardiovascular, we talked about that. Good. So in the patient education, I'll kind of show you guys where this is on the app. And if we're kind of here and we go under interventions, patient education, right? You can click on it and it'll take you to it. It's either going to be a JOSPT, JOSP perspective, like it is there, or it's going to be, um, or it's going to be one of the Physio U ones. And the nice thing is you can just mail these to your patient, right? The other place you can find them, I don't know if you guys can see my screen, but if we go to special tests, nope, sorry, uh, patient education. So patient education, lumbar, right? We have different things. So let's say we wanted to do disc-related pain. Click on it, right? It's a short video, a short read. It gives you some of the common exercises, right? Some of the common things I've talked about. And again, if you click here, you could share this page, send it to your patient. All right. So if my uncle's calling me from the East Coast and he's telling me about his back when he sits now that he's on Zoom all the time, um, I can ask him a couple things. I'm like, hey, man, send him this. It gives him this a general read and some exercises that he can work on. Good. Okay. Um, good. All right. Oops. There we go. All right. So let me go back to the app thing. Okay. So if we go back to CPR ortho lumbar right here we're under this one let's say we click on here dr lemoyne yes sir is it sanjay uh, up, just to, yeah just to, um just to clarify um related versus radiating pain yep. um so radiating is stems from nerve tissue yes and then related pain you said stems from somatic referral can so be, like yeah. muscular or can be okay can be but it's, it's more likely disc which is kind of can be considered somatic but not visceral obviously and then disc is different than like neural or i'm just having a trouble yeah, yeah. kind of yeah no, of course. Just no, i got it yeah too. so if we have a oh, do i have anything nope so um if we have a disc bulge right and it's stretching mm -hmm. this is the annulus right here's your disc and it's and it stretches it right no 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 entrapment site in the foramen no nerve irritation just this stretching of the disc can refer pain down the leg, right? So I'll, the example I give the patients if they're not getting it would be like, um, so if someone, if you have a heart attack, right? Where do you feel, especially ladies, where do you feel it at most if you have a heart attack, right? Up in your jaw, your shoulder, your left arm, right? right? Women go to the ER all the time because they actually have a, a cervical radic on the left and they think it's a heart attack because they're told every time they go see their doctor when they're over 50, these are the common signs and symptoms of a heart attack. Your jaw hurts, your shoulder, your arm hurt, right? But it's not, there's nothing wrong with her jaw. There's nothing wrong with her arm. It's just, that's the referral pattern from the heart. Um, and so that's kind of the same idea as that's the referral pattern from your leg or from your back is into the leg. So they come and they say, man, it hurts way more in my leg. My legs, my legs on fire. Um, and they're trying to ice their leg, ice their leg. And they don't know why it doesn't help. Right. And it's pretty cute. It's like, oh, okay, well, this uh, that leads to my education. And really, there's nothing wrong with your leg. That's just where you happen to feel it. Like the source is in your spine. So that would be related. Now, let's say this is my disc bulge, right? And now let's say it's a big enough of a bulge or it just happens to maybe become a herniation. And now it's actually into the intervertebral space where it's touching the nerve root, right? Remember, our nerves are very sensitive. We hit our funny bone, it hurts, right? Um, if you have a, if you're going to get a root canal, 
they numb your, they numb you up. There's a reason why they numb you up, right? Um, nerves are very sensitive. So if the nerve is being touched by this disc, now yes, you have a disc issue that can cause related, but it's also irritating the nerve root causing radiating. So you kind of get these, these two things, right? Um, so then the goal would be like, oh, how can we treat the disc? Let's do repeated movements. But now you're doing repeated movements and you're pinching the nerve that's irritated, so it's going down the leg. So you're kind of stuck in this catch-22 where I want to centralize things, but I can't centralize things too much because then it actually pinches the nerve root as well. So you kind of have to try to go more towards neutral, more towards traction. They talk about being traction, being very uh, one, of the, one of the better modalities for these disc bulges or disc herniations, sorry, um, because it just opens it that way. Cool. Does that make sense? Thank you, yes. Yeah, of course. It could be an example of, I guess, reduction of nerve entrapment. Sorry, can you say that one more time? Sorry. So traction could be like an example of nerve entrapment reduction. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. Sure can. Yeah. So, all right. So you see prone mechanical traction. It's the only one that research supports. Uh, now, can you ice? Can you do um, e stim? Can you do all these things for just pain reduction? Sure. You can definitely do those for pain reduction. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, the research doesn't support that it actually helps long term. So that's why we haven't placed it in there. If we go back to here, so again, we're under this kind of lumbar radiculopathy, manual therapy, right? If they're super pain limited, we're just working on um, nerve, trap, nerve entrapment reductions on their side. Maybe we're working on PAs. We're working on nerve mobility. Maybe we're working on nerve mobility with the traction, sliders, tensioners. If it's chronic, we're really slumping the heck out of them, right? So we have different options for nerve mobility. But maybe we need to work on hip mobility, right? We know that if their hip is stiff, where are they more likely to move from? The spine, right? If they don't have good hip flexion when they bend forward, their spine will do more. If they don't have good hip extension when they walk, their spine will do more, right? So we have these compensations from below. Good. So that's all manual. If we look at Therex, right? Our Therex may be for mobility deficits, so it kind of matches. They're doing mobility deficits for their nerve. They're doing mobility deficits, right, for lumbar. Those are all things we talked about today. Nice work. If they're working on coordination, right, maybe they're working on changing how they bend forward, changing how they rotate. So these are all those movement tests we talked about, except instead of just doing it where it hurts, they've learned to correct it and change it, right? So, for example, if we watch this one, I don't know if you – can you guys hear the video? Oh, okay. So I'll say that. So patient supine, looking how far the hip moves out, and you're just palpating the ASIS on the other side, just seeing what they have, right? So now you have them do it. How do they move, right? And here she's going to fake, right? Obviously, you can see her pelvis comes up quite a bit. So then instead of her hip abducting and externally rotating, She's really going into lumbar rotation, right? So that could irritate someone's back. So then we want to train her. So maybe I tack it down. That helps manually stabilize it. And she rechecks. What happens to your pain when you do that? Then can she do it herself? Can she tighten her abdominals? And then do it again, right? So that's kind of one of the more common, one of the more common rotation tests. And then we'll go back one more, All right? And then functional movement. So again, some more training for reoccurrence. So looking at that squat, lunge, right? Hip hinge with a stick, All right? So it's kind of more like functional stuff to say, hey, yes, you're feeling better. We don't need to do as many nerve mobs, but let's train this proper pattern. So when you do go back to the gym or when you go back to picking up files at work, right? You have a little bit better form. All right. Um, so the last thing I want to show you on the app itself would be under the special tests app, right? So here again, we got lumbar. So let's say you don't want to necessarily go down the whole CPG pattern, right? Here you just have all the lumbar tests, right? So here's all the tests that's kind of been included, right? But we can also just look at, well, what are our disc herniation tests? Your well leg raise is also known as cross day leg raise, right? Just different name, but same thing, right? Maybe I want to look at 
lateral herniation, right? So I'd be more like femoral nerve. Maybe you want to look at lower quarter neuro exam. I can't remember my dermatome screen, my myotones, my reflexes. All right, so we've kind of have it all just just the testing. The nice thing is now we can totally just um, type up right reflexes and it just gives you this list of the reflexes. So instead of having to kind of find it in the app, the hard thing is it's going to search all of these. So you're going to have some stroke things, some upper extremity things, unless you're a little bit more specific. I find a lot. Okay. All right. So last thing I want to talk about is back on this PowerPoint. Well, how are you guys doing with that so far? Oops. How are you guys doing with the idea of the difference between related, radiating, differential diagnosis on how to rule one in, maybe rule one out, um, interventions as far as entrapment site reduction in nerve mobs versus centralization, repeated movements, education, limit flexion stuff for the related, limit extension for the radiating. Um, does that kind of maybe make two clear paths for you guys? Dr. Lemoyne, I had a general question. Is this Johnny? Yeah. This hey, Johnny. Tim. How you doing, um, doing good. How are you? Um, for, is the main difference between when you're referring to a disc bulge with the referred pain and the disc herniation, is that the nerve that's kind of being impacted by the herniation versus not with the bulge? Is that yes. the main difference? Yes. Yep. Okay. So and then with right. SLR, it's for herniation, not bulge. Is that correct? Yes, Just cross straight leg raise. Review. Yeah, okay. cross straight leg raise is positive. You need more herniation because technically the bulge is nothing to do with the nerve, right? Um, but remember, we talked about those false positives. If you're checking someone's nerve, it might go into posterior tilt lumbar flexion, and you may get this false positive. So you got to be a little be a little clean with those tests. Okay, thank you so much for the clarification. So, yeah, so the related has nothing to do with the nerve, you said? Yeah, referred and related leg pain. Are not nerve impingement test are not a nerve. There's no neural tissue that's irritated. The pain they feel down their leg is referred from the disc itself, from the spine. So they should have a negative reflexes. They should have normal uh, dermatomes, myotomes, um, straight leg rays should be negative for their symptoms. Now remember, everybody has nerve tension. Everybody in the world, you can do a straight leg raise and eventually, but it shouldn't bring on their leg pain. Their leg pain should only come on when they do their spine stuff. Okay, thank you. And that's for related leg pain. Of course, yes, related. related. Okay, I know so it's, thank it's you. It's tough because we're all R. They should have been, so should have won some totally new number or name. And then one more clarification then um, from, from a question was, then the disc bulge will respond better or should respond better than to repeated movements. Totally, yep. In terms of the straight leg raise, Dr. Lemoyne, what is the normal range until everyone starts to feel tension? Because like oh. you said, you have a positive, but what's the normal range where you're like, okay, they're over a certain amount of a certain degree, that's okay. I think so. It used to be 70 degrees. It was kind of like, oh, everybody should get be the 70 degrees. But there's now studies that show that there's asymptomatic people. They have no problem and their nerves only go to 50, <laughs> right? They just don't have good neurobilly. So it's more important to look for a 10 degrees different side to side. So consider 70 is what's considered normal. Some of your ballerinas and gymnasts and yoga people get to 90. Some of your old guys that don't get out of a chair get to 50. They have no problem. That's just, that's just their mobility, right? So it's more looking at side to side difference of 10 degrees, check, or does that reproduce their pain? And I'd say clinically, right? I spend you know, many, many hours for many, many years in the clinic with these patients and you ask them, right? They bring it, you do a straight leg raise and they say, ouch, that hurts. Right? Oh, man, that hurts. That hurts. And I say, is that the same pain you get when you drive? They're like, oh no, no, no. That's a different pain. Okay. Cause people don't like it when you crank on their leg in general. I think someone said earlier, maybe there's a fear component. I agree. But I mean, if you cranked on my leg, eventually I'm going to feel a stretch, but I kind of know what a stretch is. I'm aware of it. You guys are all rehab specialists, you know, or you're going to be a rehab specialist. You know what a stretch is. It's not dangerous. We have to realize there's a lot of people out there that really have never ever stretched. They don't have, they don't know what it is. Um, so they think it's dangerous, but really it's not. You just got to educate them. Good questions, guys. Good questions. Okay. Um, all right. So I do want to respect everybody's time. So I'm going to go through this last part, um, but I might go through a little bit quicker than I anticipated, but it's more about, well, let's say you have someone with nerve problems and you know what, maybe they're, 
maybe PT is not for them. They're too acute, too painful. They have what we call hard neuroscience. So they have a reflex that's a problem. They have, um, maybe they have a foot drop, right? They have myotome weaknesses, right? That's in, those are the things that we want to look out for. That's why we do these reflexes to say, hey, are you safe for PT? Before I ask, hey, what diagnosis is it? It's like, oh, are you even safe for physical therapy, right? So this study kind of looked at just trends in physician visits. And the idea is back pain is getting worse, right? You can just see back pain is the blue one, just progressively getting higher and higher and higher as time goes on, right? And we do a lot more MRIs now, right? And unfortunately, what do you think happens when you do MRIs? They, they may show a problem, even yeah. though they're more necessary. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a big correlation to the more MRIs that are done in a certain state, that correlates to having more surgeries done, right? So Idaho does the most MRIs per capita, right? Take that in mind. They have a lot less population per capita. They have the biggest amount of surgeries per capita. So it's not a it's not a coincidence that it matches, but yeah, if you if you if you're going to do MRIs, right? In 2011, we're up to 32 million MRIs, right? There's 31 million point there's 31.5 million seconds in a year. So there's more there's an MRI quicker than every second in the United States, right? So they're happening all over, and they're just they're they've they've doubled in the last 20 years, right? So what do you think that means for surgery, right? You're gonna have more surgeries, right? And unfortunately, if you take an MRI, right, you're gonna find stuff. I think you guys said it, right? So here in this study, they took a thousand people that were asymptomatic, a bunch of different ages, and said, hey, these are all people with no back pain, no back pain, no leg pain. And they put them in these MRIs and just to see what they saw. And if we look at right, 30 year old, people considered young, right? 50 of them had disc degeneration already, right? These are asymptomatic, no pain, right? A disc bulge at 40. Yeah, flip a coin. One out of two people have a disc bulge at the age of 40, right? So if I have low back pain and I go get an MRI, it's going to say a disc bulge. What is a surgeon going to want to do? Potentially fix that. Maybe that disc bulge was there a decade before my back pain even started. It has nothing to do with it, right? As we get older, I think it was 80s, 90s, um, or 60, 70, 80 year old, right? It's pretty much normal to have disc degeneration, normal to have disc loss, right? It's kind of like that, uh, that Billy Madison movie where the, the kid pees his pants and they won't let him get on the bus, right? All the pool kids are doing it. It's kind of like it's, 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 it's more uncommon to not have anything go on, right? Um, so I kind of tell people in the clinic, I'll tell people, hey, it's like getting wrinkles or gray hair, right? If you wake up in the morning and you start to have wrinkles on your skin, you know, maybe you're a little irritated. You're like, ah, oh, bummer but you're not freaking out, worried that something's wrong and you go rush to surgery, right? If you start to get some gray hairs, you start to think, oh man, I'm, I'm, my, my cells are aging. So we want to think of it. We want to educate people that the structure you have in your spine does not equal the pain that you may feel in your body, right? Those two things do not correlate, right? Um, this study said that if you do have an MRI, you're eight times more likely to have surgery, right? So, if someone's coming with low back and they're asking me, should I get an MRI, should I get an MRI? Don't you need to know what to treat? I'll get an MRI so you can know. I'm like, I, I wanna very nicely tell them, right? You know, hey, I don't need an MRI. Now, if they had a foot drop, they had red flags, a positive neuro exam, so obviously, yes, send them out, right? Be smart, but I don't want everybody going to get MRIs because it means you're gonna have more people getting surgeries that don't need it. And we'll talk about when we say we don't need it, right? So that's kind of just talks about surgery. Here is, um, again, just the increase of operations over the years. So as MRIs have gone up, low back pain has gone up, MRIs have gone up, surgeries have gone up, everything's going up, right? Um, between 96 and 2001, so this five-year period, you had a 77% increase, 2015 to 2016, a 30% increase. So again, fusions are just jumping up as well. Right? So the trend does not look good for surgery, right? They're starting to do more outpatient surgeries now, same day, drive in, drive out, right? 650% increase, right? In these disectomies now, right? right. So why, why do patients want surgery? Right. I'll ask you that. What are, the, what are the big things patients are hoping to get out of this? 
It's gonna make them better. Yeah, pain, right? Pain reduction, right? What else? They want the fits now. Yeah, so they want that pain reduction and they think the surgery will help it immediately, right? I, if I had, if I had, how, what's the saying go? If I had a dollar for every time someone told me, you know, my leg still hurts. I thought I had the surgery to make my leg pain better or the total knee people that come in. Man, my knee's killing me. I, I had this knee replacement so my knee wouldn't hurt. And it's like, hey, you got to realize you had a big surgery. It's normal to have pain after surgery, right? So that's right off the bat patient's perspective right? we're not even meeting the perspective so that's kind of comes to maybe the surgeon the surgical team to say hey after surgery you're not going to miraculously wake up and feel no pain it's normal to have pain after surgery right but that's the big one is they want pain right away they want pain fix number two is they want to improve function right i want to be able to do this again but a third one which is interesting in these big surveys that they did of patients was uh one of their big fears was complications right so what do you think is the number one reason why people don't have surgery? Fear of complications, right? The grandmother had a surgery, worst case scenario, and she died on the table. That would be worst case scenario. My grandpa had a surgery and he never walked again, right? So people hear these horror stories and they don't want surgery. So we would like to think that they don't want surgery because they think they can get better with rehab. They think they can get better with conservative care. That's not the case, unfortunately. That's not what these studies show. These studies showed that really they don't, they don't do surgery because they're fearful of it, not because they think ours is better. So that's kind of unfortunate, right? Good, okay. So we'll quickly go through these surgeries, right? The four kind of from least invasive to most invasive, right? So laminectomy, right? So they're either just kind of cutting part of the spinous process off just to make more room for the nerve root, right? Um, this study looked at comparing people that had laminectomies versus non-surgical group, right? And initially, um, outcomes at the one-year, four-year favored surgery for the non-surgical group, but long-term, eight to 10 years, there's no difference, right? So initially, you have these improvements in surgery, but really, at eight to 10 years, there's no difference between each group. The bad thing is, a quarter of the people that had surgery had a second surgery by 10 years, right? So if they sign up once, they don't get what they expected, I think. Good. Okay. Here's another one that looked at surgery, decompressive laminectomy for degeneral spine. Success rate, 80% 80 effective if, here's a big if, if they had leg symptoms, right? If they only had, oh, spelling error there. Sorry, guys. If they only had low back pain, localized back pain, the outcomes are very poor, right? So if, there, if, if surgeon's going to cut into them and take out part of their bone, take out part of their spine, but they don't have any leg symptoms, right? The nerve doesn't need to be given more room. So is it really going to help? Probably not. If anything, it's just going to make it worse because you added trauma to their spine. So remember, remember that sur surgeries can be good if you have these things going down the leg, right? So those would be our laminectomies, our decompressives, our disectomies, right? It's kind of the most common one performed in the United States in the younger people that are having this low back pain, leg pain, right? Pretty common. Um, success rates can vary 60% to 90%. Again, if done for the right reasons, what do you think those reasons are? Some type of, you know, disc intrusion onto a nerve. So it has to have leg symptoms, right? Not an MRI finding that shows a disc bulge, right? Um, has to have clinical findings that match and on the MRI find has to be a size big enough. So we think of like, you know, five millimeters is like nothing. Five to eight is considered moderate. If we're starting to get above eight to 10 millimeters, we think of large. Um, those are the ones that can start to encroach. So um, yeah, so if done for the right reasons. All right, pretty common in athletics, right? NBA, NFL, right? A lot of them, three quarters of them return back to play. Um, right. We start to think that a big part of them not going back to play is the fear that comes along with it, right? So it's making sure we educate patients on, hey, it's okay to be active again, right? Look at these high level people that are going out, running around being tackled every Sunday and they had the same surgery you did, right? Patients afraid to move. Oh, I can't bend over put my shoes on. Hey, you see that guy? Let's pull up a YouTube video of this guy running, diving on the ball, being tackled, getting up, no problem, right? We had the surgery for a reason. 
did not have the surgery to be able to sit down and rest all day, right? And so it'll be active, right? So, right. Fusions, um, primary region is going to be for your older degenerative spine, all right? However, this huge Cochrane review, RC, so looked at over 2,300 patients. And really the evidence in general, they said they couldn't support good or bad. So inconclusive um, on really if this surgery is helpful or not for people with stenosis. So no conclusion, right? Here's another systematic review that had 600 patients that really said no difference at six months to a year out, right? We can say, okay, maybe you're recovering. It's been six months, so you're recovering. Um, two years out, favoring surgery, but then at four years out, it's back to the, it's, it's no different than the group that didn't have surgery. So it's very, it's much, so either A, the surgery that they're doing isn't really helpful, or B, after surgery, they're not doing the right rehab to set them up for future success. Right? I think of it that way. I don't want to dwell on the fact that they had the surgery and they shouldn't have. We can't change the past. The goal is to be like, hey, you had the surgery. We want to make sure that four years from now, it's a, it's, we don't want you to be in the same group. You should be better than that, right? So it comes to kind of rehab, right? Um, this is kind of a funny slide. No, maybe not funny. Wrong choice of words. Um, it's an unfortunate slide in the fact that, right, someone had surgery at 92. 2005, they fused a level above. 2008, now they're fusing a level below, right? It's kind of just, it's just, it's just this circle, this vicious circle of like you just keep trying to stop moving. Oh, it hurts in your spine? You have arthritis? Let's fuse it. Take that joint away. Oh, next joint up hurts? Now let's take that movement away, right? It kind of puts these people, and then they call it, you had, a, you know, you had failed surgeries. All right, last one would be disc replacement. All right, the goal of these replacements now are instead of fusing them together, it's like, hey, can we replace it so we have we can maintain motion at that joint so it doesn't stress the above and below, right? The same is if we fuse the joint, the ones above and below have to do more. Let's see if we can keep some motion. Um, so they're so slightly better than fusions at one year, but really two years, no difference, right? Um, you know, that number, 30 to 40%, Persistent pain and disability, that's pretty high, right? So we wanna make sure uh, we're, we're aware of the outcomes so we can educate patients, right? So summary of lumbar surgery. So one third of patients have con continued to have functional loss, disability, right? So not the greatest. Um, does a second surgery fix it, right? You think patients that come in, had the surgery, didn't work? I can see it's, it's, a, it's a, a thought out, it's a good thought to say, well, maybe they did the wrong surgery. Maybe they messed up. Maybe I need a second surgery. If we think of it as meds, you see a physician, they say, hey, take these meds, take 400 milligrams. You take it, didn't help. Okay, double it, take 800. Oh, I feel better. You had one surgery, didn't work. Ah, oh, double it, have a second one, right? So we don't want to blame patients for it being poor thoughts, but unfortunately, it doesn't really, doesn't work, right? So more is always better. All right. Um, Nice thing is that a lot of this education now is starting to come out where we had this huge jump up in the right 2005, 2010, but now we've started to slow down a little bit because now you start having people put in like the New York Times that say, really, there's no benefit to these surgeries, right? They're, they're considered next to useless, right? So take all that with a grain of salt, right? Hey, back surgeries are bad. That's kind of what I just said. Now let's say, well, who should have back surgery? Because there, there is a very sub, subset population that should have surgery. And those are the people that have neurological deficits, fractures, cord compressions. If someone comes in with cauda surgery says, if you can get them in surgery within 48 hours, they're likely to have a full recovery. After 48 hours, a lot of their bowel, bladder, all that stuff doesn't necessarily come back nearly as well. Right? So we do want to be aware of it. Um, and that's why we do a neuro exam. Right? But we're not doing it for arthritis, skeletal pain, low back pain. We're not doing it for that, right? Um, okay, I think that recap I already talked about in the last one. Just start, yep. All righty. I'm going to stop sharing screen for a second. Cool. All right. Thanks for everybody that was able to hang on to there. I know I seem to always go over, but um, any, any questions or anything about um, radiating or related leg pain? Anything about maybe spinal surgeries? We got some questions that were kind of holding off in the chat. Um, 
yeah. we'll, we'll address it right now. Um, so if we're teaching someone to like avoid these movement faults that say excessive flexion, ex um, excessive extension, um, when and how do we re reintroduce these movements? Because we don't want to just tell them, hey, you know what? Like, I never want you to go into flexion again. I never want you to go into extension. Mm -hmm. um, with that kind of tagged on was, um, what do you, what's your opinion on the Jefferson curl? Um, do you know, I'm assuming you know the, Je the Jefferson yeah. curl is? Okay. Um, let's see. So the first question was about um, when do we introduce, when do we reintroduce some of these movements, right? Yeah. And I would say there's some research that talks about if someone's been pain free for two weeks, let's say it's an acute disc bulge, um, and they've been pain free for two weeks, um, then you want to start to introduce flexion, right? So that's if we kind of actually followed some of the studies. But um, the uh, the idea of if it's more of a chronic issue, it's been there for a while, I'm not going to wait symptom free for two weeks, right? So that's the guy that fell off his bike in a big flexion curl, you know, strained the disc, you're letting tissue heal, avoid it. Um, the other people, it's like, hey, let pain be your guide, right? So I'm going to teach you to do these normal movements. Hopefully, they, we can decrease symptoms. But eventually, I want to say, hey, it's normal to stress these tissues. Let's just not stress them too often, too much, too soon. Kind of like that's, that's the definition of these movement faults. So um, it's when I'm sitting, I, I'm okay with you slumping for a second, for a little bit. Your spine should be able to flex. But I'm never going to say, hey, you should go sit like that for an hour. Right? Why would I stress the tissue that way? I'd rather save it for when you do a squat, save it for when you bend down, save it for when you're playing with your dog on the floor, right? Um, so it is important to introduce those movements. I totally agree. Um, it's just deciding, was there like a traumatic incident or are we more looking at like just chronic and the tissue sensitive and we're trying to slowly introduce those motions. Got it. Okay. Um, the second one, Jefferson curl. Um, and just to make sure, one where you're holding weight and you're slowly curling down from top bottom, like kind of maybe even on a step or something and stuff, right? Um, I think if you train your body and you train your tissues to handle those loads and you go at a slow systematic pace, I think it's okay. Now, would I tell someone who had a flexion injury to go do that right away with weight? No, but I'm okay if you are training yourself and you're starting slow and you're gradually increasing. Um, I'm okay with you doing that. There may be a limit on how much weight I let you lift with that, knowing that hey, it's, it, we know that the stress is the disc. For any of you that don't know what a Jefferson curl, it's like doing a, a purposeful flexion of your spine, trying to curl thoracic, lumbar, like and letting weight pull you down, almost like it's like stretching. And yeah, your paraspinals are working, um, but it's definitely stressing your ligaments and your disc stuff. Um, but if you've trained yourself to move like that, I'm okay with you doing a little bit of that, but I don't want you to move like that every single time unless it's purposeful, right? Because the, the, the worrisome is if you've trained yourself to move like that, now every time you go to bend over on a desk to bend over, you're always flexing like that. Well, wouldn't you want to use your big butt muscles to do it and hinge at your hips, right? Let's use the muscles that have more resilience. Use the muscles that can handle the load more. So Another question um that was in the chat was how would you treat an anterior posterior uh lysthesis uh, an anterior posterior is like a spondylolisthesis yeah um i i ideally it should keep them in neutral right you keep them in neutral teach a lot of like trunk control core bracing um you try to stay away from like posterior pelvic tilts anterior pelvic tilts um, and then you work on a lot of like limb movements so working on like bear crawls working on um, side planks working on paloff presses, working on like a lot of things that, that strengthen the muscles, but your trunk is very neutral and you're having to fight, you're having to fight that rotational or flexion extension um, bias. Um, you work on that for a while, pain gets better, and then you slowly start to increase like range of motion. And you say, hey, I wanna make sure you don't hinge at one segment. So normally if they bend backwards and it's all at L4, L5, that's where they get their hinge point. That's where their spondy is. It's trying to make sure they know how to bend at L1, L2, L3. So maybe teaching them to bend over a towel behind their back, making sure they have really good thoracic mobility. Uh, so it's kind of like more of like a motor control. Awesome. Um, but normally it's stabilized first because they probably got that listesis for a reason because they moved there too much. So let's strengthen the area. Stabilize. Um, and then do you do any manual therapy for these individuals? The, the spondies? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it may not be, it probably won't be mandatory to those levels, but the segments above, right? If I'm doing like thoracic spine mobility, I'll have them do like press ups. I'm really trying to do like PAs to their T spine to get it to move. Um, I have a couple of gymnasts now that don't necessarily have spondies, like uh, in the imaging wise, but they have a heck load of extension and it hurts with extension and they have really tight hip flexors. And so we're working on a lot of like stretching. So I'll do like contract relax and a lot of like manual therapy that way um, to try to increase hip extension. So that way it doesn't pull them into an anterior pelvic tilt, which is lumbar extension. But then I'm also teaching them to do like all of their presentation poses, all of their motions and say, can we get extension anywhere else but there? Try to get it somewhere else. Awesome. Um, this is kind of a question that I wrote down. I know we have talked about it, um, but with regards to a neuro screen, when are you doing a neuro screen? I know there's some debate on, you know, you, you do a neuro screen when, you know, when it's below the gluteal, only when it's below the gluteal fold, or, you know, if it's just when I have any neural symptoms, what, uh, what would you say about that? You know, um, the, there's like a very defined definition that like the APTA has, right? Um, and it is, right? If symptoms go past the gluteal fold or past the acromion for upper, lower. Um, so that's kind of their definition. It's location-based. Um, if someone has pain going down the leg, they talk about numbness, tingling, burning, anything that sounds like a nerve, um, I would definitely do a neuro exam. I, I may not do the full neuro exam, Right? I may do like a little bit of a modified if I'm in a clinic and they're talking about this kind of pain in the back of their thigh. Uh, they don't talk about any weakness. They don't talk about any like clumsiness. They're able to walk on their toes and their heels. I might skip maybe my dermatome, myotome, and I'll just say, let me do my safety check. My safety check being, let me do your reflexes, right? Because if your reflexes have an issue, especially side to side, right? Your, let's say your patellar tendon on one side is good, the other side's not then it's like, okay, wait a second, let me go back and redo it. So sometimes I'll take little shortcuts based on they don't seem irritable, they don't have any subjective complaints of nerve stuff, even though it's going past their leg. Then I may say, hey, one safety check, and then I'm going to do nerve tension. I want to bring it on. But if they're irritable, I would do a nerve exam before I do a straight leg raise, before I do a slump. I don't want to crank on that nerve if there's some type of nerve injury. Uh, another question. Just yourself. Perfect. Another question that came into the chat was, um, you know, when we were talking about PAs uh, with radicular pain, is this to address just simply hypermobility at the targeted lumbar vertebrae? Because um, my understanding is that extension movement with PAs can cause entrapment at, and compression at the nerve. Yeah. So, so it could be for hypomobility, agreed. But also think if, I don't know if you guys can see that, right? So this is my nerve root or my intervertebral space. This is my typical nerve size. There's room, right? If I get a nerve irritation, my nerve gets swollen, right? Nerves swell. Nerves swell very easily, unfortunately. All right, so now my nerve is bigger. So now there's less room because this nerve is bigger, and now it gets adhesed. All that swelling, right? Swelling, inflammation is like, um, it's like a little gummy substance. It's like cooking pasta that you forget to stir. It gets stuck to the bottom of the pot. So now you have this nerve that's adhesed to the size of the joint. So a lot of times we're gonna do mobilizations just to get movement at that level to see if we can free the nerve up from the sides of the space, right? So yes, we want joint movement, right? Um, I'll use the example, if you ever had a drawer, a drawer, you're trying to draw, open the drawer up, the drawer won't open, it's stuck, what do we sometimes do? Now you close it first, right, open it up. So someone who has some nerve issues, some back stuff, I may need to push it the other way, but it's not necessarily because I want to improve extension, right? I'm purely doing it just to get some wiggle in there, right? Get some movement to see if we can get some things to be freed up, right? You're getting, you're moving fluid, you're moving all kinds of things. So it could be like a adhesion removal would be another word versus maybe extension mobility. Awesome. And believe and me, I wish I, I wish I learned that way earlier in my career. <laughs> I was always like, oh, why do I want to push them into extension? Extension hurts. Would it be safe to say then that they have full extension mobility, but they have hypomobility at the segment you're working at then if it's stuck within that one parameter? Well, the nerve can have hypo, the nerve can have hypomobility or be a mobility deficit. Or are you talking about the actually facet? Okay, so you're saying the nerve has hypomobility based off your straight leg raise findings. Yes, or okay. my maybe even forward bend where the nerve should move through the canal. Got it. Uh, so, um, 
yeah, so it may be, maybe you're not doing it for joint stiffness. You can, I don't want to take that away. I'm saying that could be a reason, but you can also do it purely for entrapment site reduction, getting the nerve to move, getting things to be freed up at that local segment. Is that also helping you with your, you know, diet, with your diagnosis and your objective exam in terms of if I can reproduce pain at L5, that is a disc, that's a disc bulge. No, not necessarily, because it could be, I mean, it could be a nerve root impingement as well. If I push on L5 and it causes pain down the leg, yeah. I can, I mean, so I'd say not that itself doesn't help because uh, it can go for both. It's more going to be a full presentation of neuro exam, active range of motion, and listen to their story. Um, are you younger and it hurts with flexion things and you can't really define your location or it hurts with extension things and you're very clear where the pain is on your leg? Got it. All right. Cool. Good. Hopefully that was clear. Um, sometimes that can be a, a tough one, radiating versus referred. So hopefully that's clear and hopefully you guys can take the information, help some patients, pass some board exams, all that good stuff. Right, cool. Uh, all right. If I, I think our next one is, um, here, I'll share screen real quick, put it back up. Two weeks from today. Yep. And we'll do very similar stuff, but uh, for the neck, right? We'll do radiating pain in the neck, for the neck and arm pain. Three, same time. Hopefully there will not be an NBA Finals playoff game on 